There was once a great city newspaper in a big city, and the editor of the paper called one of his chief reporters in and said, Ed, we have an unfolding news story that is very strange, very mysterious, and I want you to follow up on it. Matter of fact, Ed, I've already got the title for the story. We're going to call it The Mystery of the Vanishing People. I don't know how close you followed it, Ed, but here are the facts up to date. As you know, over the last period of several months, almost into a year, a number of people have suddenly vanished from their homes, from their offices, and walking the street. And they disappeared for a month or so, and then suddenly reappeared with a very vague and strange explanation of where they'd been and what had happened to them. In spite of all the police questioning, we, we don't know what happened to them because they themselves didn't seem to know. As you know, a famous senator was suddenly disappeared. Uh, an employee disappeared, and the employer found out that he had been, hadn't come to work that morning and phoned the home, wasn't, wasn't there, he just vanished. A high school boy disappeared, and a month later they all turned up dozen or more people in the last year or so. Very strange, and we can't seem to get from the people themselves what had happened to them while they'd been gone. Go to work full time on it. Find out what it's all about. I sense something big here. Remember the headline now, The Mystery of the Vanishing People. So the investigative reporter was very excited about the assignment. And being experienced, he started to think about all the ways he could start to unravel the mystery. So he interviewed some of the people who had disappeared, asked them questions, probed a little bit, tried to even try to trick them into saying things in case they were hiding something. But even he couldn't get the full story of what happened to him from them. They seemed sort of in a gaze and yet they answered all his questions. So after investigating for a couple of months, the trail seemed to lead toward a certain large building in town, out toward the edge of town, where it was just a little bit isolated, and yet a lot of traffic went by and a lot of people walked by this particular building. So his next step was to go out to the building itself, which occupied several city blocks in an enormous place, which he somehow had never heard of before, and had large grounds in it, big high wire fence around it. So he drove out and parked at a distance to get a distant view of it at the start, and he put on his, put on his, up his binoculars looked through them, surveyed the whole scene, the buildings, the grounds, people inside. And he saw the sign on the front of the building that said, Institute for Scientific Research. Institute, Institute for Scientific Research. He didn't know what it was all about, what they did there, but he felt that they had some connection with the mystery of the vanishing people. So he spent two or three days driving all around the enormous area of the building and the grounds, looking at it from one viewpoint, then from another viewpoint, taking notes. And he noticed one thing, that everybody that he could observe walking in and out of the building and on the grounds were just normal, average people that you'd see anywhere, men, women, old, young, and some in suits, some in work clothes, some joggers even, jogging around the grounds. Everything appeared to be perfectly normal. So he didn't know what he was investigating yet, what he was getting into. So after several days of distant observation, he decided to come a little closer. He didn't want to spoil anything by 
drove working too fast. So he drove his car a little closer this time and walked up along the sidewalk that passed in front of the building. And as he's walking down, casually looking, pretending not to be studying the building, a very beautiful woman came over to him inside the fence, and he was outside the fence on the sidewalk. Very beautiful woman, beautifully dressed, charming, gracious, smiling, and started talking with him, called, called, out, called out to him and said, Sir, come over. You might be interested in what I have to say. So they had a conversation, and he was a little bit puzzled at what went on because he knew, as any man would know, that she was suggesting certain rewards for him that she could give him if he came inside. It seemed a little strange, and the whole thing seemed quite strange. So he uh, told her no and walked away. Next day, walking down again, a businessman came over, a man in a suit. He said, sir, I have a um, proposition for you, a business proposition. If you'll come on inside, we'll uh, talk it over. You can make a lot of money. That's what we're here for. I'm here for is to show you how you can make a lot of money. Again, that seemed a little strange to him. But he, uh, being quite suspicious, said, no, uh, I think not, thank you, and walked away. His curiosity was more than aroused at the whole thing that he had uncovered so far. So his next step, he decided in his own mind, was to infiltrate, to walk into the place, get a much closer look. But there was one problem there. He saw that the gate at the front had a guard on it, and he didn't want to go through the guard. He might be asked for identification or asked questions he didn't want to answer. So he took his car and drove way around toward the back where the fence dipped down a bit and wasn't visible from the grounds, because he saw guards patrolling the place too. So he went way back to a corner where the fence was low and he could climb over it without being seen and thereby be in the grounds. So he climbed over the fence, walked up quickly, went be kept behind trees until he got closer to the enormous building. And at a certain point, he was able to walk right in among the people themselves. And in a moment, he was lost among them so that he didn't appear any different from anyone else because they were dressed just like ordinary people and he was dressed, dressed casually. So with his hidden microphone going, he wandered all around the building, buildings in and out, <coughs> taking notes, mental notes. And after only a few minutes of walking down the halls, and looking inside and listening, he couldn't believe what was going on inside of that building called the Institute for Scientific Research. And what he saw was this. He saw classes of people, 50 or more people in classes all throughout the building. And he couldn't believe what he was hearing, yet he knew his hearing was very good and he understood what was going on. He realized that he was in a university of evil. Those classes were taught by teachers who was telling the students how to be evil, how to commit crimes, how to commit respectable crimes, how to start wars, how to deceive people. And they had special classes he noticed in how to appear decent while actually performing evil deeds, how to use propaganda, how to get on television, how to use the media, the news media, for getting what you want, for joining with others in conspiracies to steal and to destroy and to hurt. Then he realized something else once he'd seen that clearly. He understood what had happened to him outside on the grounds, on the outside, the sidewalk. He understood how they recruited people 
as someone would walk by the grounds or perhaps park for a minute, someone would come out and try all kinds of lures to get them inside, the woman and the man and various other people who would appeal to what they thought the passerby would want. And the people would be lured in, and once they got in there, they were given certain kinds of drugs that would keep them in a hypnotized state. And then they'd get them in the classes where they were thoroughly propagandized, thoroughly brainwashed. And after completing the course, they were sent back out into the world. Perfect examples of thoroughly indoctrinated by evil human beings who would go out and wreck the world while appearing to be helping it. He realized he was on to one of the most, the most astonishing news stories of the century since the invention of news, perhaps. So as he started to walk out, he saw two big burly guards walking toward him, and he knew he was in for it, so he began preparing his answers. And they came up and asked him for his identification, and he tried to bluff his way out but they were too big and too many for him, but so they grabbed him and realized that he was there as an intruder, as a spy. And they grabbed him and handcuffed him and brought him down, and sure enough, they had a rather little prison, small prison quarters set aside for people who snuck in there and found out their evil story. But he escaped. He knew how to pick locks and how to sneak out. So he did. He got out, climbed over the fence again, got in his car, and drove away. The minute he got in his car, he knew what he was going to do. The first thing he was going to do is head for the chief of police, which he did, chief of police of the big city. So he drove up to police quarters, showed his press badge, drove in. Are you ahead of me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I drove up to police headquarters, got out, <coughs> took the elevator up to the chief of police office, went in the chief of police, we may know him. Hi, Ed. Hi, chief. He wasn't ahead of me. So he started telling the chief of what he had seen, the horrible scene that he had witnessed there. And he wanted them to, of course, get the police and raid the place and arrest all those people and investigate them. And after telling the police chief the story, the police chief pressed a button. Now you can catch up with it. And five burly policemen rushed in, handcuffed him, and brought him off to jail. The police chief was one of the institute's graduates, of course, as well as the rest of the policemen and languishing in jail, the police are a part of it. The police themselves are a part of the criminal conspiracy to destroy the world and to cause heartache wherever possible. Managed to escape again, get out. Well, if the police are part of it, I'll have to go to the chief ahead of me again. Mm. Of course. So he went to his chief and told them the whole story. Again, the policeman rushed in right in the middle of his telling the story, and the, the editor of the newspaper was part of the conspiracy, too. He's beginning to, he's beginning to wonder if he's losing his sanity. Everybody is part of the conspiracy to wreck the world. Not only that famous senator, not only that college boy who was there, not only that secretary who vanished and came back. The great and the small are part of it. He managed to escape again. This time he was a little smarter. Now he knew, now he understood thoroughly that the whole world was that way. And he understood that far from going insane himself, he was going sane. And he knew by 
observing that intelligently that he could have been had there not been a little warning system inside of him he could have been one of those graduate students to go out and use his power of reporting to help wreck the world but some little message told him don't go inside he knew that's what would have saved him he knew that he was not he was not a part of that conspiracy gave him great relief to see that after all the years of his living that he had become starting to become sane and not insane as he had previously thought so he again escaped got out and he knew what he had to do this time so he moved to another place changed his name changed his individuality as far as exterior appearance is concerned and from that day forward he spent the rest of his life telling other people what they knew being wise about it being careful about it knowing that this world with all its graduates and practically everyone was a graduate of it he realized he realized that the school was not just that institute that building there but the University of Evil consisted of every government building in the country, consisted of every church in the country, every school in the country, and heaven help us all. That University of Evil consists of every home in the country. So that's how he spent the rest of his life. Do you have do you have, do you think, maybe acquired a little signal inside of you, a little learning system so that, so that one of the graduates with whom you live, by the way, with whom you associate, with whom you talk all day long, that one of those graduates who's learned evil quite efficiently and has learned to disguise it, to call it good, to make you think they can give you something instead they're out to destroy your very soul do you have a little signal inside of you that tells you what's going on so that you're not captured by them don't you know that you stood out on that sidewalk of that university of evil and that woman or that man or that group came over and lured you inside and you took the course because that is what you wanted at the time listen to the reporter listen to the cosmic reporter who's trying to tell you what's happened to you and every other human being you listen to him instead of the city editor instead of the chief of police instead of the president of the board of education and that congressman and that reverend that's who you've been listening to because they tell you what you want to hear we're telling you hear what you need to hear you don't you don't even know you need to be rescued from yourself that's how lost you are you don't know you need to be rescued for heaven's sake wake up Now is the time to start. Right now. I don't know of a single thing, not a single thing, that prevents you from waking up, that is being in a state of capital U understanding right now. I don't know of a single reality what I do know is your present low level of understanding is nice to you. I don't have to do a thing. All I have to do is follow. See, you won't, you won't dare lead yourself into a different kind of a reaction to the challenge out there or the challenge in here. Shall I tell you what you are? You might want to write this down. I'll tell you what you are. If you're suffering, if you're 
confused, if you're scared of anything, I'll tell you what you are. Write this down. This will, this will answer your, all your questions, including the one about depression. I am a memory worshiper. Right? Right. What else do you have to live from except the accumulation of everything you've ever thought before 10 to 7 on this Wednesday evening? Go ahead, you tell me. You can't tell me. All you know what to do is what you've always done. You think the way you always think. You feel the way you always feel. And what is that? A consultation of memory. You look to it, it just, it's just as if you have a whole bunch of films inside your life. As a matter of fact, it has been recorded there just like a film. All these films, when the challenge comes up from the outer world, no matter what it is, I don't care what it is, when the challenge comes up, you press a switch to run that particular film of how to, how to act. Because if you didn't press that button and start the film rolling that tells you how to act, you wouldn't know what to do. What would be, you tell me what would be wrong with not knowing what to do to a psychological challenge. Not a practical one on the daily level. You know what to do if your house is on fire or if there's no food in your cupboard. You know what to do about that on the practical level. You tell me why you have to go into the memory vault and think of all when the challenge comes up. Why do, you, why do you think at all about it? Why don't you stay so awake that you know that the consultation of memory is just another form of self-worship. Memory worship is self-worship. You know what's going to happen if you press that button and start this film running, the film that says, behave this way or that way, you know what's going to happen, and what you know is going to happen is the reactivation of your memory self. That's the, can you, can you believe that this is the only thing that is of concern to us, that we press the button, that it doesn't make a difference if we press the wrong one. It doesn't make a difference if I press this one, that one, that one, as long as I press some button to activate the picture frames, the fast running picture frames, in which I am the center of the film. And you press those, those films, any of them, and it's going to lead you into destruction. It's going to lead you into destruction because all films are in time, are they not? And time is going to come to an end for you and for me. What do you think? What do you think happens to all these films that you've stored up for all these years when you die? What do you think is going to happen to them? I'll tell you, you know better than the Christians or the Zen Buddhists or the Islamites. If you're relying on that, to get you through not only tomorrow, but 50 years from now, 60 years from now. We'll make it 100, then we're all included in it. A lot less than that, probably. What are you relying on to hold you together tomorrow? The film. Try sometime not pressing the button, sitting back and seeing what happens if you don't if you don't activate the memory film, if you don't activate yourself, see what happens. I'll tell you what. Nothing bad can happen to you ever, ever, ever again. Nothing. If you refuse to poke this and say, I should get jealous, I should get anxious, I should get... I don't, I don't care what you have brought on yourself. Through all these years of storing up the negative films, 
one refusal to press the button and it's just as if it never existed in your life. The film has hours in it, it has days, and it has very emotionalized activities in it. If you don't press the button, what's the use of the having the film at all? There's no use calling on it, it can't take you anywhere. The reason the film can't take you anywhere is because there's no one there to be taken anywhere. There's no few. There's no future for you. Do you know that you have no future? There's no future for you because you don't exist outside of the every little frame that runs through the film camera that you turn on and watch yourself. Something comes up in the day, in your day, which is a problem to you, a crisis to you. Because you are a robot, nothing more than a robot, with all these films inside your head, you say, I must press that reel fast to protect myself. And the very act of protecting yourself is the very thing that harms you, but we don't know it, we don't understand it. And there's no way that the film can understand itself. All I can do is go through the same grim experiences all day and all night for years and years and years and quote mark quote mark know that there's no other life to live I'm looking out at a room full of human beings of men and women of various ages various experiences I'm wondering if there's I'm wondering if there's one of you in this room who has the audacity to not press the button anymore. To catch your hand that someone made a, a sarcastic remark to you, someone doesn't like you anymore and your protective device of reaching the hand out to press the button for the proper film to make you feel good, to make you feel okay, to make yourself feel protected. You can watch the hand go out and start to press the anger button, the withdrawal button, the bashful button, whatever. You can watch your hand, if you're watching carefully, you can watch it go actually go out inside your head of course and press down the button that you think is going to help you avoid getting hurt maybe I've given you in just a few minutes the whole secret of changing yourself inwardly what happens is that your reactions go so fast, bang, you're gone before you know it. And someone says to you, why did you watch yourself so you could slow down the reaction of pushing the self-protective button, which is not self-protective but harmful. Why didn't you watch yourself and already you press another real fast. You're embarrassed by the fact that you weren't adequate, that someone gave you a lesson and you couldn't remember it and your shame or embarrassment at getting caught presses another button. Oh, I'm so dumb. See, you just pressed another button. There is no life in the film. There's no individual in the film. Furthermore, there is no need for you or for me to help a film at all to run or to record experiences except for practical purposes of learning how to cook dinner, knowing how to cook dinner. Why do you use your mind for anything except that? What is this mass of accumulations? that have been piled in, into our minds all these years that we begin to believe in their necessity 
and you believe in the necessity for being scared. How many of you are scared? Raise your hand, every one of you. Why do you come here class after class? And I tell you class after class, look, this lady and this lady and this man and this man. There's no need for you to be apprehensive over anything. Why don't you investigate what I'm saying instead of believing in the film? Instead of looking at it and saying, that's what I've always known, therefore it must be right. What is popular is not always right. What is familiar is not what is good for you. What is the easiest thing to do, like press the button, is the exact opposite of is what is good for you. The trouble is, trouble is, you see, your memories are you. Get, watch the connection I'm going to make now. All your memories of your past, psychological memories, mental memories connected with a supposed self, they are you. If all your psychological memories were to be taken away, you would cease to exist. Yet, you would exist in eternity. See, I can't say you without you activating a film even as I'm talking and I, I see the problem, I see it quite clearly. But I have to use words you, but I, when I use the word you, you take it as being real. I'm using the word you consciously, as far as I'm concerned, but you're taking it unconsciously to think that I'm talking about you as the bundle of memories. You as the vault, you as the film. I know that it's a fake. I know that it's not you. But you kid me when you tell me you come here to get rid of your troubles, to get rid of your heartache, to get rid of your tears, to get rid of your fears. I know better because I know that you have identified with your memories, which makes you a self-worshipper. And if you are worshiping yourself, if that's what you love, which you do, all lost people are self-lovers. <laughs> They're loving an illusion about themselves at that. If you're loving yourself, and close your eyes while doing it, which you are, how are you going to see through the illusion that what you're looking at is nothing but a film? I, you take my word for it. It's nothing but a mental film that goes through your mind. And when you don't know how to behave, instead of sitting there with no reaction at all, you press a button real fast in order to protect the whole vault. You say, look, man, I've lived 20, 40, 80 years, and you're asking me to give all that up. Well, listen to the question. You're asking me to give all that up? Yes. I'm asking you to give up hell, which is time in favor of eternity, which is timeless. That's what you're asked to give up. Something comes up. Something came up today. Something that threatened to disturb your ha-ha peace of mind. Something came up. And without knowing what you did, you reached for the proper button to push to keep to get the proper film going, to make yourself the center of the reaction. You want to be the center of the reaction, which is you, which is your withdrawal, which is your anger, which is your jealousy, and so on. I'm asking you to be so alert from now on for the rest of your life that when someone looks at you angrily, you get a crank phone call, 
you get bad news either from out there or in here I'm asking you to stay so awake that you refuse to reach your hand out to press one of the buttons because if you can even start to do this you will see as your hand mental hand psychological hand reaches out to press the right button you hope and there's so many you don't know bang 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 it's very haphazard as the hand reaches out to press the one that's going to make you feel good or recover from the hurt or whatever you will see it moving and something in you that is developing says this room high no that we're talking about that we've talked about all right the hand is going to travel from here to about here where the button is ready to be pushed the problem comes up someone says something cutting about you you're whatever you see the hand cut up oh it goes <laughs> i'm slowing it down in slow motion am i not it goes so very fast like lightning but you're watchful you see the hand getting ready to go over here and press the button because you have been criticized and now you're doubtful that you exist as say the adequate nice intelligent person you've been criticized and feeling doubts about your own existence you start the hand over to press any button you don't care what one is laying because any one of them keeps you in the center of the film it's the angry one or don't you talk to me that way or the sullen one or the tearful one you don't care which one as long as you're the center of them you're the center of every one of them doesn't make a difference you can't lose follow now so you very alert and very watchful and see the hand start to go over the press of the button but you now remember it's your work you have to do it and when it gets halfway over there's something in you that says no when this voice capital V when this voice with a capital V says no halfway over to the button you habitually push it, it will shake it will vibrate it will go like won't it I see some of you nodding you must have yeah. been doing it it will go like that and it will shake you and you won't know what's going on but I'm telling you this is what is known as a new experience this is not an experience it's going to be registered only in the memory but in a higher only in the old type of memory with its mechanical roles which has its place but in a higher type of memory a work memory you can call it that so that tomorrow or hopefully an hour later ten minutes later five minutes later one minute later when the hand comes over you see the jolt again right you see the jolt and you remember the previous jolt and you remember this jolt and you begin to get real scared do you know why by the way I hope you're following me do you know why you're gonna get scared when the jolt happens come on now you should be able to figure it out All right. the hand comes over originally to hit the film the jolt comes right here and because something higher than memory is now interceding operating you get the jolt over the stoppage of it and your fear will mount now careful real careful now your fear begins to mount because here here I'm nobody if I can just go to over here I'm okay see I know who I am I'm that hothead
I don't know who I am here. Well, I'll tell you, if you ever get to this point, again, don't miss a class. You're going to need all the help you can get, or you'll get lost at this point. What you have to understand is the fear of not reaching yourself is a sneaky, cunning film in itself that has sneaked into the operation, and I can only carry the illustration of this and this so far, it breaks down, has sneaked in and said, if you don't press the button, you will be extinguished. So everything depends upon every time you catch the hand getting over, or reaching over, stay so alert that you not only feel the jolt, the nervousness of this new experience, <clears throat> but can detect the lie that is ready to follow it, pounce on it, and whisper in your ear, this new experience is danger, don't do it again. Don't listen to a talk that tells you about this. Don't come back to a class like this. Block your ears even while sitting here. And I want to tell all of you here something. And all of you listen to this tape. You, you are, you're unaware, as I'm talking to you now, that you have had right now, three minutes ago, two minutes ago, one minute ago, you have had this experience that I talked about of getting to a certain understanding of what I'm saying and then unconscious, because you're unconscious about everything, you know, except you stub your toe and that hurts physically and then you remember that. But you're unconscious about everything that goes on inside you. So you don't know, but I know that when I explain this to you, that this was happening inside you. What happened inside you was what I just explained to you. That the fear of being nobody crept into the situation and told you, don't do that again. Don't go that far. Don't explore like that. Don't listen to talk like that. What, what do you, l listen. I'm telling you, what is talking to you is death. Death in the form of the film that says all you have ever had is the mechanical repetition of your daily reactions and experiences. This, and it says your name, Jim, Dauphine. It says your name. This is your life and the devil is trying to steal it away from you. The devil whispers to you, because you don't know the devil yet, you don't know yourself yet. The devil whispers to you and says the devil is trying to take away your life. Don't listen to it. I am God. Well, I'll tell you, do, you, do you know what you're getting now? The devil whispers to you, says, I am God. Follow me, worship me, stick with me. If you listen to these teachings that you've been hearing, you will die. I'm going to tell you that you're dead now. Every one of you is a dead human being seated in this room. What do you think of that? And I am telling you that here you can learn to know that you're dead, which you are. You have no life. All you have is mechanical parts 
activated on a certain in a certain way from a higher source god is the author of all life including the physical life of the body and of the trees and of the sun god is the author of that but you have not permitted god truth reality to give you any more than the life in the flesh now most certainly you have that you walk and you talk but you but this is all there is and it's that's not your life it's not your life because it will come to an end with the death of the physical body now if that's all you want for your life then you can settle for that I'll tell you, you you know there's something that brings you to these meetings time after time that says I want more than this living death that I've existed in up to this point correct yeah. all right then we're talking discussing to the right people and the right right topics if I can be lied to who's doing it who's lying to me let's find out and this is we'll, you see we're back where we're starting who is lying to me is the film what is lying to you? The, the devil is the film. The devil is time, repetition, unconsciousness. There's no life in a film. No life at all. Part of the film, one of the films, is called a fear reaction. Right? Being frightened. Being, being scared. And this film is one of the most important for you to activate unconsciously unknown to yourself get this as you come to this class and begin to wake up because what comes into this room far from being a whole hearted attempt to wake up is just this tiny little person this wandering person this cosmic curiosity that comes in here and says Boy, I'll tell you, I may not be honest with the rest of the people in the class, and I can't even be honest with myself, but my feeling is honest. I can feel that I don't know. I can feel that I, I don't even want to know. Ninety-nine and nine-tenths of me doesn't want to know. So even as you're sitting, you're, you're look, look. You're lying to me. Bang, bang, bang as I'm talking to you now. I know it. You're lying to yourself. That means that the devil in the form of fear is telling you, be careful of what you accept, of what you absorb, and be a very especially careful that you don't go into practical action with any of these things you're given here. For example, if during the break, or if tomorrow, you see another person that you're, you don't know how to behave toward, you're afraid of them, or whatever, they, you feel they dominate you, can hurt you in some way, the devil will say to you, press the button that will seem to give you life but the button you push will be the button of death always because all buttons are that way and because you you're not awake you will press that button and then feeling afraid feeling terrified is your life Feeling terrified is your death that you listen to the devil call life and you say, I'm shaking and I'm vibrating and I know what to do about the challenge, which is to be afraid and get as many associated actions with that as I can. When I'm afraid, run away. Always run away. Never face anything.
why don't you go up to someone you're afraid of? Right in this room. How many of you are afraid of another person in this room? Raise your hands, all of you. Why don't you go up to that person and say good evening? <laughs> hmm? Are you aware that you're not doing this? I didn't say you, you, you like to do it. I said to do it. And it's no concern of yours what they do. Do you understand that? Yeah. What concern is it of yours how they react to what you do? Hmm? That boss, look, the boss just bawled you out for that bad work you did and your temptation is to sulk to start to criticize him to stay away as much as possible you want to destroy death I'll tell you how to do it you walk up to the boss and talk to him about the error that was made just explore it maybe you were wrong maybe he was wrong what what different the how long are you going to live on this earth? What do you care about that? Please. What do you care what you have to go through as long as you go through it and destroy it? You're afraid of the boss and you're afraid of everyone else because you hide out. And the hiding out is the pressing of one of the films. I feel safe sitting back and getting mad at him and explaining why he was unjust to you. Someday it'll suddenly occur to you right in the middle of your day what you are doing, what you are doing by thinking. What you're doing against your eternity by thinking. Listen to what I just said. Thinking, 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 driving yourself crazy, right? right? And then you think about this. You're not going to find the answer that you're looking for, part of you is looking for, in thinking. You've believed it. You've believed it all your life. You've got these... How many schemes do you have going on in your mind to get something from someone else? How many little plots you've got to win a victory in this social world? How many phone calls do you make? How many letters do you write in order to make yourself feel as if you're going somewhere and accomplishing something? Or to the contrary, how much mental seclusion and cowardice do you engage in in order to hide out from facing the facts, from facing the, the world. You can go through this life meeting all challenges. If it's necessary to think, to consult one of the films in order to repair the broken roof, then you consult the film. And it will tell you to get hammer and get nails and get a piece of repair material for your roof now that you won't get wet during the rainy weather you don't know that there's a higher source of consultation other than the one you consulted to repair the roof because this is all you've ever known what you do know is psychological cons consultation with the films in which you must do one of two things in every situation. Conquer or be defeated. And even defeat is, is acceptable to you because then you can cry, right? You can cry and you're the center of that film. Here we are at the point we always arrive at in these talks where you have to begin to do something different. 
people, you have to stop getting excited over gifts people give you, over flatteries people give you, over the fact that they phone you and write you letters and give you public honors. You're going to have to give up that kind of thinking. You're also going to have to go to the opposite of that, give up the thinking in which you get disappointed over anything. And if there's no you, if there's no, if there's no self there, how is there a self to be disappointed or to be elated? I'm telling you, you're living a life of death and you don't know it. And, and you are so stupid. I look out at this room and I see human beings in this class who miss meetings over the weeks, over the months. And I know, in spite of the incredible information you have been given tonight, you'll probably do it again. In spite of me calling you stupid, you'll do it again. You'll do it again. You'll do it again. You won't listen. No one, no one is smarter than your memories of how to behave. Well, I guess I won't go tonight. And then you think of the reason. You stop listening to that reason. And, and you absentees, you force yourself to come to every meeting. And this is an awfully good reason for it. You force yourself to come here and watch when you go out that door and get in that car, the 50 reasons that death gives you for not coming here. Well, let's see, it's certain miles out, 57 cents a gallon, whatever it is. That's $2 gasoline, $2 to get in. That's $4. if you're never going to die. Try giving up that TV show some night in favor of eternal life. Now look, not so fast. So you come here so you walk in the door, and so you sit down. <laughs> the battle has just begun. What's been your state of mind in the last 40 minutes that I've been talking? Have you even paid close attention or has your mind gone off somewhere? Have you been thinking about something else you'd rather be doing? Have you been hypnotized in the wrong way? I'll take you. I'll take you with me, if you'll let me. Every one of you in this room. I'm not going to take your husband, ladies. I'm not going to take your wife, gentlemen. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to take you. Trash shall not enter the castle. You think you're kidding me? Do you, do you think you're kidding me? For your sake, I, I can't afford to be kidded by you, and I'm not. I see the tricks you play, but you don't even know her tricks. I see your tears. I see your pretense. I see her glancing at me and glancing away, and I know what's going through your mind. You're going to trick yourself all the way down into the, the swamp.
right, rightfully, hopefully, there is something that is not deceived by my self-deception or your self-deception. You, in your present state, don't know what it is because all you know is self-deception. All you know is the films with its thousands of little evasions. But I am telling you as a fact that it does exist. I'm telling you as a fact that if you begin to remember this one exercise I gave you of watching the tension start to rise and watch your mental hand reach over to write it, to push the button, to protect yourself, to blab, to do anything. I want you to know that your very awareness of your hand reaching over to press the button will stop it. But it won't be a smooth stop. It will be a jolt, because there's a jolt between time and eternity. There's a jolt between practice and learning. There's a jolt between knowledge and wisdom. But you can, can become aware of the jolt, and don't do anything about that. I told you the devil will have his tricks ready to have you try to do something about the shock of your embarrassment. Never do anything about your embarrassment. Be, be fully sh ashamed. But knowing that you're ashamed. Till the time comes where it'll become a daily practice for you to watch yourself do the usual sick, neurotic, self-enclosed thing. Catch yourself about to do that and something screams at the top of the voice, no. All shakings are not of you. All shakings are of the pseudo-you. All shakings are of the devil. Only the devil trembles. God never trembles. Essence never trembles. This means through your self-work, through your recovery of who you really are, you will shake less and less and less and less because you're getting rid of the devil whose very nature it is to shake, you see? And you become more poised and more calm so that you'll be able to die consciously too. To be afraid is to be unpleasant. To be fearful is to be rude. By that very accurate definition, how many rude people do we have in the room? Don't you know that other people are picking up your level, your attitudes, picking up your gloom by your manner, by your words, by the way you walk? Don't you know they're picking up your nature from the atmosphere that you radiate as you walk by them even? They may not know they're picking it up, but they are. And that means you're rude to everyone you meet, whether you talk to them or not, the stranger in the grocery market. You didn't know you were that rude, did you? You didn't know you were that bad-mannered. You never knew what you were giving to the world. Well, I'll tell you what you're giving to the world. You're giving to everyone you meet, including those children you claim to love. You're giving them what you are. So what are you? You know what you are. You know how scared you are, and you know how, how your fear makes you rude, how it makes you unpleasant, how it makes you snippy, how it makes you curt with people. There's only one way to have good manners, and that's to wake up. Good manners is not opening the car door for the lady necessarily alone. Good manners is to open the car door for the lady and radiate strength that she can sense whether she wants it or not, gentlemen. What do you care whether she wants it or not? 
What do you care, ladies, whether he wants it or not? What's that to you? You don't care about him. You're not supposed to care about him. Only God can care about him. You can't. You can't. You never will. Only your desires pretend to care about him or her. The only caring comes from truth itself, which is not you, which is not me. We are rude. We're inconsiderate. And we send out into the atmosphere of the whole world what we are, which is why you see the insanity on the TV news, which is why it won't be any other way as far as the world is concerned. What do you care about the world? You don't really care about it. I don't care about it. I don't care one cent, one and a half cent about it. I'm not concerned with that. I'm not concerned with darkness, and you shouldn't be. You should be concerned with the fact that you can change, be transformed, not be scared, not be rude, that you can look at any situation and be so awake that sleep can't come anywhere near it, where you won't tremble, where you won't wonder about it. You'll know about it. You'll know about it because you know your own nature. And you know your own nature because you studied it, explored it so deeply, and never ran away from anything. You never ran away from your own evil, from your own sickness. And you said, if this is sickness, I'm going to find out what it's all about. I'm not going to go into my own phony moralities, which I despise, which I don't understand. I don't want to give gifts to people, but I'm forced to. What's the contradiction there? Can I study it to see what's wrong? Instead of resentfully giving the gift or pretending that I forgot or finding some phony way to handle it, why can't I be so whole that there's no challenge from this world, whether it's a healthy challenge which could be out there or an unhealthy challenge? so that I know what to do with everything because I know what to do with myself because I see I don't have to, thank God I don't have to do anything for myself or with myself. What are you going to add? What are you going to add to your essence, capital E? What are you going to add to that? Addition comes with the, with the calculating arithmetical med mind that says add this, get rid of that add this, subtract that. All the adding and subtracting are gone. You know where, you're, where you are, you know what you're supposed to do, because you found out what you don't have to do. And what you don't have to do is pretend, what you don't have to do is protect yourself, what you don't have to do is run around looking for things to make you cry. You, you, you don't know you do this? You look around for things to make you cry. You haven't had a good sob for a half hour. Or your bitterness, your, your bitterness against the stupidity of this world which you dimly sense. What do you care about the stupidity of this world? What has that to do with you? You still want it to have something to do with you so you can start the film rolling and go into your dramatic act of this kind or that kind. Light has nothing to do with darkness. You get yourself involved in trying to figure this world out, trying to fight inflation, wondering whether abortion is right or wrong or capital punishment is right or wrong. You want to continue to live this way and torment yourself by trying to make decisions and then flip-flopping to the other side when someone makes the slightest argument for or against your position. Why don't you live without positions? You can, you know. When you're not who you imagine you are, you don't have any positions at all. You have no decisions to make. You have no you have nothing to do but be sane and live in the authentic pleasure of being a sane, whole human being. And you just let that world rage at you all at once. Let any human being yell at you all at once. 
You've got a lot of work to do. You've got a long ways to go. You better put yourself in the hands of truth and you had better do it soon. I see you coming here, coming here physically present in this room and wasting your time. Why, why do you want to be miserable when you don't have to be? It's because you call your miserable misery the only life of happiness that can exist for you and you have sealed yourself inside the tomb. And I'm looking at you right now, people who have sealed themselves in there, in the darkness, and your imagination says, your imagination says, I'm living in light. And every time you stumble over something, you can't figure out why you stumbled over it. The reason you stumbled over it is because your imagination is saying this is light. If you stumble, you're in darkness, and you would better let that stumbling and those headaches and those fears and those those nervous shakings, you had better let them teach you the lesson that you're in darkness calling yourself in light. The light, the light reveals itself to an honest human being, to a human being who will go to the very end of his sins. You won't go to the end of your sins. You're too much in love with them. You love to hate them, for example. You love to be moral, and you love to be what you call moral. What you call moral. Immorality is to be rude to other people, to radiate fear. That's what rudeness is. You won't have real good manners till you wake up. What kind of good manners do you have now when you just Destroy, help to destroy and help to injure everybody you meet by your gloom, by your suppression, by your frozen facial expressions, by your blabber mouthery. Don't you have any decency at all, any of you? Can't you be decent? You know you can't, I'm afraid. You don't know what it means. Well, you have a chance here. You'd better make the most of it. In your illustration about the hand not pushing the button and starting the film, are the films eradicated or something like that when the hand no longer touches the button? They fade away. There's no further use for them except for practical purposes. Why resort, I'll change the illustration just a little bit, why resort to reaching for a bottle of poison when you've understood that it's poison? You're not going to reach for it, are you? Do you understand it's poison? If you don't know it's poison, you're going to take it, calling it pure water. What have you been drinking today? What sour, self-harming moods have invaded you and taken you over today. Look, let me let me add something. Please, go ahead and burn yourself up with hatred. I don't care. I really don't. I don't care. I'm not responsible for you. Go ahead. Wreck your life. Goodbye. If you're unreachable, what's that to me, for example? What's that to me? Some of the, one of the, the, the only chance that some of you in this room has is for me to be very severe with you. Because if I'm polite to you, then you take that politeness, the devil in you takes that politeness as being a sign that you're all right. You're not all right. And I'll kick you out and I'll ball you out until maybe, and this is just a maybe, in individual cases, the pain becomes so bad that you give up and collapse. And you'll hear the angels sing when you do that. Instead of the devils whispering to you. 
the one chance you've got, I'm telling you, the one chance you've got is for me to behave towards you exactly as I behave towards you as the class as a whole and as individuals. No matter how I behave toward any one of you, that's the right behavior for you, even if you don't think so. And I'll switch that be I'll switch that behavior from a smile to a clout in one second. And if you can't take it, then goodbye. I'm marvelously free of every one of you here. That's so nice. What you were saying about anger, I can only use that as a proper idea. I, only, I can only do that intellectually because I do not feel when I get angry or upset or express negative emotions, I don't feel I don't feel it. When the film starts running, you are the film, therefore you can't stop it. Now what happens to a totally sleepy human being is simply the replacement of one film by another film, but it's simply is mechanical self going on. One minute I'm real angry over something, and then that film is only 50 feet long, right? It runs out of its own nature, of its own nature because it comes to an end, the film comes to an end. But then I feel a little bit panicky over the ending of that film of being angry, and so I'll think of my next phony self-centered film, which is to find something to be, quote, happy about. And I del uh, put up in my mind my TV shows coming on, I'm going to have a good dinner, I'll make a phone call, something that will make me happy. But at the same time, so I've, uh, the old film comes to an end, the next one starts, but I am the center of both of them. And that's all a sick person cares about, is be the center of the film. What we're trying to do is let a film come to an end. As we see it coming to an end, you see your anger, for example, start to subside, as it will. See, at the minute it starts to subside, you watch very carefully how a hand reaches over and wants the next phony act, just as phony as the anger was, to start the next one. If you can catch it just at that minute as the old one starts to fade out and before you press the button to start the new one, you've, you've snapped time a little bit. You've seen between the two railroad cars. The film is always a painful state because it's separated from God. The film is time. Time is separation from God. Truth. You want truth? capital T, that's okay. It's separation. No matter what, what film you touch, you're going to be in pain because there's a part of us that wants to go home to the father's house. The film is the prodigal son. It only, it only appears to give us life. It only appears to give us direction. But if it was real direction, would there, if we were in the, really going in the right direction, we would have a sensing of it. But we can't have the sensing because the sensing of going in the right direction is higher. It's cosmic, not mechanical. Maybe some of you in this room has a, a faint sensing that you're heading in the right direction, right? You can, you can nod your head to that if you have. I am constantly the cause of my psychological movement all the time. But what you're saying that's to be done is so risky, it threatens everything I know. It threatens the films which you know, right? All you, all, look, all we are until we become something different is the one film after another. Don't you know how boring your life is the way it is? <laughs> Here I go, having to run the same old film again. Have you ever seen some film on TV over and over and over? Once when I was in the, the Army in Japan, they only, only had one film. They played it every night. I got to know that film by heart, every word, every gesture. Same old, well, that's all there was. Nothing else to watch. So you watch that, they call the unseen, I think it was. <laughs> and I wish I didn't see. <laughs> what? Was it good? Well, it was good the first ten times. <laughs>
That's what boredom is, running the same films over and over, knowing the same outcome. When the alcoholic takes 10 drinks and get, knows he's going to get drunk, he knows the outcome of that, doesn't he? What do you suppose we could do to stop our love of pain? How do I talk to a room full of self-worshippers, a room full of memory worshippers, a room full of people who are self-enclosed and won't study the condition? Look at the contradiction. You or me, I'm in love with myself and yet I hate being in love with myself. Kind of curious, isn't it? I love centering everything around me. That I demand that the world revolve around me, yet I hate it. Isn't your life hateful? Isn't it? Don't tell me it's pleasurable. You'd be lying. Would that be a clue that the self I love and the self I hate, that there's some kind of a contradiction there that I don't see and that ordinary thought can't resolve, can't understand. Ordinary thought is a part of the self-worship, the memory worship. It's a part of it. That means I can't think my way out. I can be, understand the whole process, how every time I think about myself, either for profit or for gain, psychological profit or gain, every time I think about it, I strengthen the illusion that there's an I there that can be rewarded or that can be punished. We come here and we understand that there, we were told that there's no central I there at all. There's nothing there to be either hurt or rewarded. There's nothing there at all. Ah, so the next time I get hurt or I feel elated, I can simply see that as a movement that is going through me instead of saying, I got hurt. Yes? The trouble is you did get hurt because you and your hurt are one thing and the only thing you've got. But if you understand that, begin to understand that, that's what Jean was talking about. Watch standing apart just a little bit and seeing it happen, seeing it happen instead of being it happen. You're not your thoughts. You're not the film. That is false life. That's life that will come to an end when the films will finally wear out. And they will wear out. You're not going to take those films beyond this life. Why do people follow a false fanatical leader who's going to lead them right into destruction? No. Let's see, how many reasons can we get? About 50 in the few minutes we have. They're in a state of unconsciousness in which imagination is, is posing as reality, in which they have even a leader to worship, someone who appears to be strong and the leader will be as sick as they are, someone who appears to be strong, someone who appears to have no doubts. See, this is what we don't, we don't want to, we have so many doubts of our own, we'll go for any charlatan. I don't care how sick he has, how fanatical he is. If he says, if a charlatan, a, charlatan, a cheap charlatan says, here's a bomb, we're going to blow up this country with this bomb. We're going to blow up the country. This is the thing to do. And, and the, the follower, doubtful man, looks up at that and he says, all my doubts are removed. Someone has removed my doubts about myself. I know who I am. I am a follower of someone who has no doubts. Therefore, my doubts are gone. It's the right thing, the man says, to blow up that other country. Let's march forward together. We have understood here that there's no way to get rid of the doubts by doing that. The only way to get rid of them is to see that they're there. There is no progress unless you see your present state. And if you think I'm going to say that a thousand more times, I'll tell you I'll say it 20,000 more times. Any work that you go into that is not preceded by your actual state, you'll be building on a foundation of sand. 
You become you become a so-called spiritual person or a preacher, and all the time you're standing in that pulpit or sitting in, at home reading spiritual literature, all that time you will be hating what you're doing because you will be hating your whole life. We want to be quite content with ourselves at all times, whether we're doing the dishes at home or coming to a meeting like this. Just be content at all times. And not, and not get up in the morning and feel that the whole world is my enemy and I have to go out and conquer it and I know I'm going to be licked. I know I'm going to be licked because we know in spite of our lies, and in spite of our trickeries, we know we have no strength in ourselves. Please listen to what I'm going to say next. The very knowledge of your ignorance, the very, the very sensing that you have no strength in yourself to conquer the world, that's the beginning of intelligence. Don't lose that. Stick with it. Stick with that, that sensing that you can't save yourself. You can't figure out whether you should buy this house or sell this car. You can, you can only go into quandaries about it. You can only go back and forth. And I'm talking about both spiritual things and worldly things. You can't figure either one of them out. Your very lack of, of understanding, if handled properly, can be the beginning of understanding. You say, I can't get this. I'm ignorant. I come here all the time and I, and I don't get it. Your ignorance is very valuable to you if you're honest about it. It's when we begin to lie about our ignorance, which you're doing all the time, unknowing to yourself. You, you say, I can't get what we're getting here. How can I get it? And then you go into endless delusions which keep you thinking about your ignorance and trying to do something about it. If there was pure ignorance with no attempt to solve it, no attempt to kid yourself about it. Yes, you just don't know anything, which is the fact. If you were to remain with that fact of not knowing anything of what you're doing with your life, that would be the death of ignorance, because facing it always puts an end to it. You can't substitute your sickness and call it health and expect to get healthy. You'll just get sicker. I, look, it's a perfect prophecy for any of us in this room. If you continue the way you're going, you're going to do, go downhill. And I'm telling you, I don't care if you're 50 or 80 or 100 years old, or if you're 18 years old here, wherever you are, truth can change you if you will give up, if you will listen, if you will not argue, if you will not think you know more than the truth. It can be done. You can do it. The truth will do it for you. So that you don't talk on the telephone the way you talk now. And you don't feel inwardly the way you feel now. So you're not so desperate for a crumb of comfort from people. That you're not afraid of the future financially, spiritually, economically, socially. So you're not afraid of anything at all. You had better direct your prayers to another source. You direct them toward your own lunacy and look at the answers you've got. And you'll continue to get them. You had better start looking up. And if you don't understand what that means, you do it anyway. You start looking up. What does that mean? To pay attention, to listen, to work, to obey, to come back again. Don't lie about why you miss meetings. Don't lie about why you miss meetings. See, I, I know something. I know something you don't know. And I'll tell you what it is. I know that God exists. You don't know what that means. I'm not talking about the word. I'm talking about a very personal experience with me. I know that God exists. And I'm telling you this, and I know that you can know it too, because if one man can know it, other people can know it. And your life will be different. You won't have all these phony moralities that you have, all these guilts, all these wishes.
wishes to, to prove that you're right and someone else is wrong, which is ripping you apart, aren't they? Right. Truth, reality can change all that. They're not, look, look, the worst thing we can do in this class is to lie to each other by treating each other with phony gentleness. Those people who come here and complain at how stern this is, how unloving it is, go ahead, phony, and go down the path you've always gone down and continue to pay the price. You've never been in a room in your life where there's been more compassion for you. Never. 